You're watching Food Allergies by Dr. Lisa Gall on Resonance Wellness TV, part of our Whole Life Medicine Alleviate series. Keep in the loop about future webinars and events on whole-life-medicine.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome to this talk about food allergies. Um, obviously, my name is Dr. Lisa Gall, and I'll be your host and guide this evening. So every time we start one of these whole life medicine talks, um, I always start by talking about the first step in the whole life medicine model. So that's the green alleviate. And that's really got three major components to it. Um, when we're talking about finding allergies, we're most definitely talking about how they're going to be one of the root causes of ill health. So we often find out that there's potential for food allergy in the root cause review. We're also talking about a main organ of elimination being involved. So helping to alleviate allergies can involve clean slate processes. And in addition, the maintenance of a gut membrane can require missing ingredients for full repair. So there's lots of these very initial things that we'll find in relationship to food allergies. So with those thoughts in mind, let's just dive in. So today what I'm gonna attempt to do is talk about the several ways that you can be allergic and sensitive to foods, um, why food reactions are thought to occur, and some of the ways that we can diagnose, treat, and attempt to recover from food reactions. And this is not a small pro problem. This is um, well known to be a large problem with big health and financial um, implications across the world not just in the developed world. And estimates are that one in eight suffer from one or more very significant and recognizable allergies. And not only that, but um, this is a quote from the past chairman of the Food Allergy Division of the American Academy of Allergy. So this has been one of the board certification um, places for allergists. And he's basically quoted as saying that unrecognized food allergies are responsible for 60% of symptoms seen by a family physician that aren't adequately diagnosed and treated. And this is not a new issue. It's really been described for 2000 years. This is a um, sculpture of Hippocrates who lived basically in about the fifth to fourth century BCE. So before Christ, so that's actually 2,500 years ago. He's considered the father, father of modern medicine in the sense that he really started um, a number of different lines of thought that became more important as modest, modern medicine developed. And he wrote a lot about diet and many environmental conditions in health. But one of the things he also did wrote, write that was that there are some people who can't eat cheese without being set in a turmoil. And certainly I'm sure <laughs> there might be some of you who are set in a turmoil by cheese, hopefully not too many. Now, there's a number of different symptoms that are considered associated with food allergies. Um, obviously, skin symptoms such as hives or itching, flushing reactions or eczema. Um, things that are found in the ears, nose and throat, such as ear infections, ear ringing, or stuffed up ears or throat or nose. Um, respiratory symptoms like asthma or recurrent bronchitis cardiovascular symptoms like increased pulses, Raynaud's phenomenon, gastrointestinal um, symptoms like what is known as IBS, or gas, bloating, heartburn, diarrhea, constipation, genitourinary ones, so things that have to do with the urinary tract, and then also central nervous system um, symptoms such as depression, brain fog, headaches, and poor memory. Now there's of course a lot of symptoms on here that's gonna to apply to many people. Not all of these symptoms are gonna be exclusively caused by food allergies, but sometimes if you've done some very rational um, treatments for these types of conditions without effect, um, you might find that um, exploring for food allergies or intolerances might be something useful. So obviously, why aren't they more recognized? So I think there's a couple of great, um, reasons for that. You know, I've been practicing now for over 20 years, and I remember when I first started out in practice, people were very reticent to think that they actually had a food reaction going on. That that concept has really um, 
certainly become not necessarily more popular, but more accepted as a potential cause um, over those these last two decades. Originally, I might say to somebody, you know, I really think that you should avoid dairy products for a while and just see how you feel. And people would be appalled <laughs> that I would take away a major food stuff. Um, especially considering that a lot of our food knowledge is very um, non-science based. Let's just say we have a lot of very interested food lobbies that want us to continue to eat the way that we do and purchase products the way that we do. And so there's a lot of vested interests in who eats what and why and when. So I'm going to literally roll through a set, all the kinds of um, reactions you can have. And so this is going to seem a little exhaustive and you might get a little overwhelmed, <laughs> just like a, a forewording. <laughs> But um, I think it's going to give you a sense of how wide the different experiences of, of having reactions to foods actually are. And we're going to start with the type 1 classical food allergy. So in the medical world, a true food allergy, a food allergy proper, is considered to be a type 1 reaction that is an anaphylactic type reaction. What that means is the response is immediate and the results um, can often be life-threatening. So here you see, as an example, a child with a very swollen mouth. This is kind of one of the classic signs of um, a type of uh, reaction to something that is using IgE as an immunoglobulin. So you're going to see a couple of different Ig. So Ig stands for immunoglobulin. And then there's different letters after that stand for different classes of immunoglobulins. So these are molecules that are being produced by the immune system. And they have common ends and then they also have specialized ends. And so these are kind of small um, uh, molecules. They kind of look like Ys, most of them. and they bind to um, antigens, so food molecules, and on the one end, and on the other end, they activate the immune system. So there's these kind of molecules floating around that are recording if you have had exposure to and are, have decided in your immune system that you're going to react to a food. So this is the only kind of... Um, reaction that's considered true allergy. And the classic symptoms can be this immediate urticarial rash. So urticaria, basically urtica actually refers to nettles. That's the Latin root for urticaria. It basically just means you look like you've got attacked by a nettle. And you, so you have a red raised rash, usually quite itchy, often gets quite swollen. You can also see what's called angioedema of the face and neck. That's actually where the blood vessels underneath the skin. So the urtica, um, urticarial ra rash actually is right on the very top layer of skin. And angioedema is swelling of the layers just underneath the surface of the skin where there's a lot more room for fluid. And so you'll see here as an example, this child's eyes are swollen shut. Um, that's classic angioedema. And then anaphylaxis uh, with shock and circulatory collapse. So if you have um, an anaphylactic type reaction, you often will have a kind of um, change in the circulation that decreases the amount of blood flow available to your heart. And this is the reason why it is life-threatening. There's also the possibility of having swelling of tissues where you, you can't breathe. Um, but the biggest risk in anaphylaxis is actually um, shock, cardiac shock. Now you can also have shock from being injured. People have heard of shock before. It isn't just allergy related. This is one of the ramifications of this kind of classic allergy. The other anaphylactic symptoms can be things like this. You can get a tingling feeling around your mouth. You can feel sick or actually vomit. It's quite common for people to vomit if they have ingested something that they have a type one allergy to. They can be breathing hard or have a croaky voice or not be able to talk if the throat is swollen. They might cough or wheeze, and um, often people will get quite pale and faint. 
Now, um, I'm going to show you a little bit about what that reaction looks like. And like I said, I was going to show you what the antibodies look like. Um, so if you look on this right hand side, I hope this diagram is clear enough. This is an example of um, using ragweed pollen. So IgE reactions also can be produced to environmental allergens. So we're gonna talk about why that's important um, in IgE in just a second. But say you have a ragweed pollen. So you can see there's a little yellow blub there and you can see there's a certain kind of immune cell that gets exposed to it. And actually um, it, that cell that gets exposed can make a large amount of ragweed IgE antibody. And when those antibodies um, attach themselves to mast cells, this is another kind of immune cell in your body, um, the second time you get exposed to that, that pollen and the pollen is a, attaching to the antibody that's primed on the primed mast cell, those mast cells degranulate histamine. So we get a whole bunch of released chemical reacting molecules, and they're the ones that actually produce the symptomatology in the body. So it's like a translated chemical signal that requires some exposure before and then a, rep a repeat exposure. And of course, most people are, are quite familiar with the concept of using antihistamines in allergic reactions. And they're not related to all different kinds of allergic reactions, but in this particular kind, like environmental reactions or in anaphylactic type reactions, antihistamines are often useful. They aren't always 100% useful, but they can help treat somewhat. Now, true food reactions are IgE most of the time. That means they're creating these types of anaphylactic reactions. Now, I wanted to just show you that because um, I want you to get a sense of how, how there's multiple steps to the production of a reaction, and a lot of it is based on prior exposure and immunological programming. So let's take a look at some of the most common food-based IgE triggers. So this is for true food allergies. These are the top um, things that will trigger an anaphylactic type reaction. Peanuts is a very common one, and most people will know about that, and other, um, and tree nuts. Milk is a top one. Shellfish, like a, sh a shrimp as an example, is another one. Different kinds of fish. Egg, wheat, and if they're derivatives, soy and their derivatives, sesame, mustard. And then there's often a handful of non-food triggers that you can see producing anaphylactic type reactions, antibiotics, analgesics, and venoms are three um, really good examples of that. Now, of course, like I said, an IgE reaction can also be um, environmental, and some people are sensitive even to airborne antigen of foods. So we think about airborne antigens in terms of like, you know, pollens, like here I'm showing a dandelion. Hopefully not too many people on this call are allergic to dandelion. There's an awful lot of dandelions in Calgary. But um, it, it can be so primed, your immune system can be so primed that a very small exposure on a mucous membrane um, can start an attack of anaphylaxis. Now, kids um, are often um, known to have anaphylactic reactions starting quite early in life. And it's thought that one in every about 100 kids will have one or more episodes of anaphylaxis. Most really only have the reaction only once. And some of that can be that um, there have been other factors involved in the reaction. Often, though, um, if that target antigen is identified quickly, we move to trying to remove them from the source of those antigens. And, of course, some of those um, reactions are are so strong that we have the coordination of schools and parents and friends to make sure that a child is not re-exposed. Now, one of the most common treatments, um, just so you know, for an IgE true allergy is an EpiPen. So this is a very interesting um, issue that comes up when we talk about an EpiPen. First of all, an EpiPen is full of adrenaline. 
um, otherwise known as epinephrine, in a preloaded syringe. And so, in essence, what you do is you jam it onto your thigh, or depends on um, if you're if somebody misses, it's it's okay. <laughs> and you um, are basically injecting, auto injecting um, an amount of adrenaline into the system to prevent shock. That's it's not an antihistamine. It's basically to prevent shock. That's why we use the EpiPen. And it will decrease some of the symptomatology. So here's the interesting thing about this. Um, epinephrine is a neurotransmitter. It's not actually immune, an immune molecule. It's not interfering with immunity. And it turns out that the nervous system is responsible for um, a lot of what we see in repetitive anaphylactic reactions. And why this should be important to you, I mean, you, if you do have a true food allergy and you have an EpiPen, you know, you should know how to use it and you should carry one on your person more um, just in case. But what I do want to tell you is that a lot of the reactions in anaphylaxis tend to get worse over time, not because the actual reaction tends to worsen over time, not because the immune system part of it tends to worsen over time, but rather that the expectations around it worsen. And so people are normally told in true allergy, each time you get this allergy, it's going to get worse. Every time it gets worse, it increases the capacity to have a very adverse life-threatening effect. Therefore, you should never come in contact with this allergen ever again in your existence on this planet. And so people really take that in. And what um, I have found over the years is there's also additional ways that you can deal with this um, type of reaction, it, especially if you don't have an EpiPen. Um, first of all, you're going to call 911 if, if you can, especially if you're by yourself um, or you're with a dependent person that you can't transport to a facility and you don't have any of the things that you would need to treat it. Um, but one of the things that I found over the years that works exceptionally well is the mental field technique. And um, this years and years ago, I actually had taught a mother and daughter how to do the mental field technique because the daughter had an anaphylactic allergy and they practiced it together. And what I didn't know is the mom also had an anaphylactic allergy, not to a food, but to an insect venom. And I, I had seen her one year and she said, by the way, you saved my life last year. And I was like, well, I didn't see you last year. So how is that even possible? And it had turned out that because she had practiced that tech, um, the mental field technique with her daughter, she actually knew it. And when she was out um, in the mountains, she was stung and she was very far away from her car. And even in her car, she did not have any allergy medications. So um, she started doing mental field technique, um, which is the acupuncture meridian tapping technique. Now, if you have never seen this, um, this little diagram on the right hand side before it's always on our whole dash life dash medicine um, dot com essential handouts page with the instructions but in essence what it is it's an acupuncture tapping technique that increases um, rest digest heal and detraumatize signals that's the end of nervous system function which is parasympathetic this is the opposite of what most nervous systems do under anaphylactic reaction um, mostly how people respond is with a fight or flight response. So you can very powerfully and very easily rein in the fight or flight response with the mental field technique. And um, in this case, where we had somebody who was anaphylactic, she literally tapped her way out of the experience. So, and this is not the first time we've controlled symptomatology with this technique, um, both physical and mental emotional. So if you're not familiar with it, um, that handout is available up on the Essential Handouts page. Now, I'm also listing here Apis homeopathic. This is a very common homeopathic that we have on hand, especially when people get the swelling type reactions. So if they have mouth swellings or they get hives or they overreact um, to topical antigens and get the urticarial re uh, rashes, a lot of the time we will use Apis homeopathic. Easy thing to have on hand. Also can be combined with any other kind of antihistamine or EpiPen or whatever else that you need to use. 
Now, one of the challenges in food allergies, even in true food allergies, is trying to identify what you're actually allergic to. And the testing for true allergies is scratch testing. So many people are probably familiar with scratch testing, especially if they have been tested for environmental allergies like hay fever, um, or they know that there's some sort of tree pollen or something like that that's bothering them. Remember I said in the very beginning, IgE reactions can be environmental reactions or they could be anaphylactic food reactions. So this is kind of like a kind of a pin cushiony sort of effect where um, known samples of a particular antigen are injected into the top layer of the skin to see what those white blood cells that are hanging out there will respond to. And a positive reaction is considered to be a, uh, what's called a wheel, um, not like the turning wheel, but the W-H-E-A-L type of wheel and, how, uh, and the size of that wheel. It's a kind of a low tech um, test <laughs> in many ways. It's, it depends on observation of the antigen, and it depends on testing the antigen you're actually sensitive to. You can also do blood testing for IgE. It has had its issues over the years. In um, more recent times, um, I've come across IgE testing and used IgE testing. It also measures other immune parameters to give a sense of how significant the IgE blood level is. Um, most of the time, if you're going to the allergist, in Alberta, you're not going to get a very comprehensive IgE panel because it's um, a funded type of test and they're complex and expensive tests to do. So we don't do hundreds of um, testing samples on a single individual. However, that is available if you are struggling with figuring out what you might be sensitive to. You can also just get the blood test. <laughs> So I also wanted to distinguish here oral allergy um, syndrome. So oral allergy syndrome is kind of can look anaphylactic, but it's localized to the mouth and throat. And it's really caused by a cross reactivity of one of those IgE antibodies that you have to specific proteins that are found in inhaled allergens like pollens that have similar proteins as are found in some raw fruit and vegetables. So not every single plant on the planet has completely unique molecules. Most of them share a lot of molecules, just like higher animals share a lot of different molecules in their biochemistry. And so um, there are some people with pollen allergies that develop oral allergy syndrome. Now, if you cook fruits and vegetables, it alters those types of proteins that, so that most people with an oral allergy syndrome are symptom-free with a cooked fruit or vegetable. And there's very wide regional variability in this. In adults, up to 60% of reactions um, like that are mouth swelling are actually cross reactions between food and inhaled allergens. And so there are a number of known food families um, oops, sorry, I got that in the wrong order. <laughs> I already said that slide. So here's a couple of examples of um, pollen families and the foods that they can have cross reactivity to. Here's three of the main ones. Here's one is the birch family. So there's birch pollen um, cross reactivity to apple, peach, apricot, hazelnut, potato, carrot, and celery. Or you can have ragweed. Um, uh, sensitivities and cross react to banana, cucumber, cantaloupe, watermelon, zucchini, or cucumber. Or you can have a sensitivity to the mugwort family of pollens, which cross react with celery, onion, mustard, and cabbage. There's actually other families like the grass pollen family or the um, alder pollen family. So you actually could ha be having a reaction that's not anaphylactic, not true type one allergy. It could just be a cross reaction. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of time to figure out that you're allergic to something in this window of time in the, out in the environment. And then you start to see these, these um, swelling reactions. It starts to, of course, you can see it starts to get a little bit confusing now because now we're starting to blur the lines between just one food creating one response. Now we're seeing cross reactivities creating certain things, 
we're seeing environmental allergies using the same mechanism to create um, an, a response. And we're just touching the tip of the iceberg right now. So allergy really does just mean other response. It, it's acquired, it's specific, usually. And it's an altered capacity to react to any kind of physical substance um, on the living tissues of the body. Now let's go to the next major category of food allergy. This is a type two allergy. This is antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. And one of the best um, examples of this are um, reactions in blood group intolerance. So this is actually a kind of anti -de antibody dependent allergic reaction. And it's related to lectin allergens that are binding to ABO markers on red blood cells. So ABO meaning type A, type B, type AB, or type O blood. Actually, O is really the lack of having the A or the B. So um, this whole classification of reactions is the underpinning of, of a certain kind of um, blood destruction reaction. And so the specific antibodies actually bind on the, on the red blood cell and your immune system actually attacks your red blood cells and destroys them because it doesn't identify them first as red blood cells, it identifies them first as antibody labeled. Um, penicillin, strong penicillin reactions can also be under this category. Um, and so often people ask me about lectin reactions um, as in food lectin reactions. So here we're showing, you know, food lectins um, having a interaction with the red blood cell. Now, most foods have lectins in them. So most of these kind of lectin reactions are really more in um, blood transfusion reactions and autoimmune anemias. Um, myasthenia gravis is um, one of the things that often will underpin a type 2 reaction. And so um, even though it is related to lectin chemistry, that does not mean that all lectins are bad. And so I, because I've heard people talk about avoiding lectins, and there's actually some diets. Um, originally, the, the blood type diet was about this. And I don't know if you remember this, but I inherited a practice that used the blood type diet. And I quickly, in a well, probably about almost a year's time, I thought, this is ridiculous. This, this diet is randomly not working. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The, the premise behind it must not be um, accurate. And there are diets that where people are pulling um, lectins out for weight loss purposes, as an example. Um, and the most common reaction, you can have reactions to lectins. You can have gas or bloating or reflux um, type of reactions. But a lot of the time it's because the food that was ingested was not properly processed. Like a great example would be not pre-soaking um, beans. You know, there are foods that actually can't just be quickly cooked and eaten. They do have a certain amount of preparation that they have traditionally undergone. If you look at the traditional food practices of many cultures, you'll see that many whole populations of people have figured out that there are certain things that have to happen to foods in order to make them more digestible. So um, you basically find lectins all over nature, like beans, grains. Um, you can also have lectin reactions that are powerful toxins like ricin, which comes from the castor plant, not castor oil, which we use therapeutically, but the castor plant. And they have um, very toxic lectin-based reactions. So that's a whole category. <laughs> now there's another category that's known as a type three hypersensitivity. And this is um, a food allergen that, that is using IgG antibodies. So this is a different category than IgE. And this is the type of response that we often um, associate with not the dramatic anaphylactic reactions, but the kinds of reactions that tend to be a little bit less um, defined in time and are more defined by like the number of troubling symptoms that are going on with it. So this is the underpinning of the delayed onset allergy. So in essence, what happens is you are coming in into 
um, contact with the food, you're making an IgG type of antibody response. The problem is that it takes a certain amount of that you can handle. But if there's a lot of it, like say you eat a lot of a particular food stuff that you have a, a type 3 reaction against, it takes a lot of time to clear out the combinations of antigens with the glued on antibodies. Because that's normally what you do. You, you you start those reactions, but you also clean them up. They don't just, they're not just free floating and in, in there forever. So you have to have the reaction and then you actually have to go through the process of eliminating them. And as a consequence, the speed is not always that high. And so you can get deposition of antibody antigen complexes in various locations until your body can clean that out. So the hypersensitivity reaction can be delayed because even though um, you're, you're clearing them out from the beginning, if there's a lot of antigens present, the macrophages saturate their capacity to remove those immune complexes. And the excess is then deposited in tissue. And so it depends on what tissues are involved. Um, but if you get those complexes into the vessels, you could get things like headaches or vasculitis or hypertension. You could get asthma reactions or recurrent infection because the immune system is constantly stressed in the mucous membrane. You could get deposition in the skin which the immune system of the skin freaks out and creates all sorts of inflammatory reactions, causing rashes and itching. Um, you can get joint deposition where, so you can actually have a delayed hypersensitive reaction that's a joint pain. You can also still get like stuffy nose and angioedema as a result of um, histamine released by immune complexes deposited elsewhere. And they're difficult to diagnose because, like I said, the reactions often don't occur until hours or days after ingestion of an allergen. And it can make it really difficult to determine what foods are the causative agents. So usually in these circumstances where people are getting clearly some sort of allergic response, but it's not anaphylactic, what I would tend to do is screen people for IgG um, responses. And you can see here, I'm going to give you an example of a testing card for, um, this is uh, the lab that I use for IgG reactions. And what this is showing is the amount of quantitative amount of these complexes. So you're basically sending in a blood sample and then the lab tests your blood sample against known antigens. So this is um, a testing well here on the left-hand side. Um, a lot of this is much more automated. It's not done by hand anymore. But on the right-hand side, you can see that there's a report back showing how much immunoglobulins evidence there is for reaction against certain foods. Now, when you do a, a, a type of test like this, you're really kind of at the beginning of an investigation process because in my experience, you can have many different things that you're responding to. And especially if those responses have been going on for a while, when you first do the test, you can have a lot of false positives. Somewhere in there too, you'll also find things that are positive and um, are probably a bit more consistent for you. But once you start these types of reactions, it, it kind of tends to be a little bit of a, a train going down the track and you're acquiring more reactions because your immune system is already starting to get more and more confused and more and more reactive to a constantly produced antigen. So it's not uncommon for things that are commonly eaten together to start to show up as being positive, even though one of them might, might be the true trigger. So this is again, not an exact science. It's a starting point for doing um, usually an elimination diet. So when we get a test like this, um, and even when we get an IgE test too for type 1 um, anaphylaxis, although like I said, that tends to be much more clear what's causing that. But in this case, we tend to pull out all the things that somebody is showing reactions to, let the anti antibody antigen complexes clear over about four weeks, and so we eliminate them completely. And then we, we test each antigen that we're concerned about um, one at a time in big quantities on one day. And then we wait a couple of days to see what happens. Most of the time people will have 
um, especially if you spent some time clearing out all those antibody antigen complexes and calming down the immune system, the next time the immune system sees that antigen, it responds very strongly. So it's a very strong confirmation response that you can get from doing it that way. Now, I don't know if you have been on the um, list for um, the food intolerance um, Facebook posts or if you've seen some of those um, messages going out, but we talked a lot about those types of responses and also using elimination diets. Um, and so if you're interested in that, you can go and visit our Facebook post, post, you'll see a whole bunch of them there. So this is a big category. It is not, again, an exact science either. You, you do need to do a little investigation still. But yet there's more. <laughs> now, you can also have a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity. And this is where there's actually less antibodies involved, more of a particular kind of immune cell called a T cell involved. And so, in essence, you're getting um, a very strong kind of inflammatory immune response in a type 4 reaction. And a lot of the time, there'll be a kind of type 4 cross-reactivity reaction um, one of the most common ones that people will be ex exposed to are poison ivy or latex reactions. These are type 4 allergies. And they typically take several days to develop. Sometimes you start to not be able to figure out what actually caused it. And they can be very, very severe because they're stimulating a part of the immune system that doesn't self-terminate reactions very quickly. So often these types of reactions can go for quite a ways of time. Um, there's um, a correlation between type 4 allergies and Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and type 1 diabetes. So these are basically types of um, autoimmune conditions. So we'll see an increased um, uh, incidence of type 4 allergies in those, in those conditions. They can also have a type 5 mediated reaction. This was more recently discovered, probably in the last decade and a bit. And it has some symptoms in common with immediate and delayed responses. So those kinds of other types of um, allergy reactions like we've already talked about. Um, but it's usually reactions to specific small molecules. So sulfites, chemical dyes, additives, iodine, alcohol, and gluten. We don't have any tests for this. We know that this exists. We don't know how prevalent it is um, because it's very difficult to assay, but we do know that there's this class of, of immunoglobulin that sometimes is involved in this type of reaction. So I don't have any tests for this one. And it just starts to give you a sense of how um, allergy understanding is continuing to develop over time. It's, it is not cut and dry. Now, if we start moving away from some of the direct immune responses, we can look at other types of reactions that you can have. You can have food intolerances that are completely independent of the immune system. You can have food toxicities. You can have food aversions. So let's take a look at some of those. So a classic food intolerance is um, usually due to an enzyme deficiency, and that's inborn. That means that you have been born with it or an acquired error of metabolism, meaning it has developed over time. And it often mimics a true reaction, either an anaphylactic or an Ig, or, or like a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. And again, sometimes based on the symptoms, you can't tell the difference. When you can start to tell the difference is when you have some time to experiment with various approaches to see what appears to actually be creating the reaction and what doesn't. So here's a great example, lactose intolerance. So lactase deficiency is very common. Um, the estimate is that 10 to 15 percent of Europeans and 60 to 90 percent of Asian, African, Mediterranean, and First Nations people have a lactase deficiency. Now, everybody has lactase when they're born, generally speaking, um, because breast milk, the highest amount of lactose out of any of the milks that you can get in, out of mammals is from humans. And so um, if you have a true lactose, lactose intolerance very, very early on, you're going to have um, a, a baby that's having a lot of problems with breastfeeding because that is the main sugar in breast milk. Um, so what happens is the lactose is not properly um, 
broken down and then bacteria love to eat it for you <laughs> and then that as a byproduct creates gas and lactic acid and that can actually make diarrhea the lactic acid if you have enough of it and so cheese is not usually a trigger for lactose intolerance because it's the way that has the uh, that has the lactose more associated with it so the the more liquidy part of the milk you can technically test this with a hydrogen breath test but you can also just test it with um, a, like the actual lactase enzyme test, which is available, it's a common lab test. Now, you can also have things like alcohol intolerance. This is not technically being allergic to alcohol. Um, it is a kind of intolerance reaction because you can't clean out the alcohol of the system very quickly. It's due to a deficiency of alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. And this is very common, again, in the Asian population, in the First Nation population. And I'm just showing you a picture here of what happens in this particular fellow. When he ingests alcohol, you see they get this very reddish um, uh, face from, and this is telling you they just can't clean up the alcohol quickly enough because they have an inherited lack of this enzyme. You can also have histamine intolerances. So um, I didn't really have a good, very good picture for this, but um, you can get symptoms by eating foods that contain histamine or foods that trigger histamine release. And there's just a ton of them. This is the unfortunate part. Um, there's lots of things that contain histamines. Um, aged cheeses can be one of them. Um, you can see this in like, uh, spinach, eggplant, certain types of wine like Chianti or Burgundy. Um, you can also have histamine releasing foods. So things like egg whites or shellfish or chocolate or strawberries, um, tomatoes, citrus. These are things that actually can increase the amount of histamine being released in your body. And you could actually respond as though you're having a histamine reaction to specific food. But in in reality, it's because either that food contains the histamine itself or it's increasing the amount of histamine release that you already have going. So some of these can start to get a little bit confusing depending, and it, it really takes a little bit of sleuthing to figure out what reaction you're having. People can also be intolerant to fructose. Now, you might've heard of this too before, that again, I, I, I've definitely seen fructose as being um, labeled as a bad thing. Um, most people can't tolerate more than 25 to 50 grams of fructose per day. So that would be if you ate about, you know, five apples a day. That's about how much fructose. Now, different fruits um, have different amounts of fructose in them. And it's not just fruits, like you'll see fructose in other foods, but it, it's highest in the fruits. So as an example, if you ate a cup of dried figs, that's 23 grams of fructose in that. Apricots, um, a cup of dried fruit like that would be about 16. Um, a half of a medium mango, mangoes are quite high, 16, point, um, 16 grams per, of that in just the half a mango. Um, a cup of grapes is about 12. So if you um, have done what lots of people do in summer and you just eat like a bunch of berries, berries can also be quite high, especially blackberries, you can sometimes overwhelm your ability to use that as a fuel. And again, what ends up happening is those fuels end up being fermented by your microbiome and bloat you up. And so lots of people are familiar with the diarrhea and bloating that's um, the end of the BC fruit run, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a run in more than one way. And you can also have hereditary amplifications of this. So there's a type of enzyme that if you actually are deficient in it, can create really big problems with fructose intolerance. Now, another um, thing that you might have heard of is phenylketonuria. This is another inborn error of met metabolism to do with food reactions. And it's to do with the processing of phenylalanine. So phenylalanine is found naturally in foods like eggs and milk, bananas, and different kinds of meats, like um, pretty much all the meats, including uh, some of the heavier fishes like tuna, soy, pinto beans. 
And if you are um, have this disorder, you will also react to the phenylalanine and aspartame. About 50% of aspartame is phenylalanine. And so an artificial sweetener will just be a killer for this person. Um, and it's actually, the reactions are so severe that there's the newborn, um, inborn errors of metabolism test. So all um, newborns in Canada and across the world in most places are gonna get tested right away for inborn errors of metabolism, including this condition, which is um, known also as PKU. So very bad food type reactions, but it's to an amino acid within the food. Now you can also have um, another common enzyme de defect. It's called glucose 6-phosphate deficiency. Most people don't really have a lot of symptoms from having this. Um, it's, it's thought to be an advantage um, against malaria um, because it changes some of the um, ability of malarial um, parasites to, inf to affect red blood cells negatively. But if you, so you, you, you're at a malarial advantage, but if you eat certain things, you'll actually create a problem in this kind of patient. So things like fava beans, um, sulfites, menthol, blue food coloring, vitamin C, so the, the plain cheap vitamin C ascorbic acid, tonic water and bitter melon can really aggravate people who have this kind of deficiency. And a lot of the time it can create some really interesting um, symptoms um, a lot of the time people will notice fatigue because they're actually losing blood cells. So the blood cells are being destroyed in this, in this um, circumstance. And it can be so bad it can create acute kidney failure. So this is not as common in Western Europeans, but it's certainly more common in the Mediterranean countries. Now another thing that everybody has heard of is celiac disease. So this is a very specific kind of gluten intolerance that affects about a, a percentage point of the population. Um, it's often very unrecognized. I think these numbers are probably getting better now. I think it depends on where you are. As an example, in Italy, they, they actually test all school-age children for celiac disease. It has a very high incidence in that country, probably because they are um, historically a little bit more, um, you know, use a lot of wheat and pastas and things like that. Um, pasta or wheat really as a crop really comes from the Anatolia um, region of Turkey. So it's a little bit more of a Middle Eastern crop. But of course, with time and colonization and the movement of people from place to place, those things have spread across the world. So there's a very specific kind of test. It's actually a triple um, enzyme test that we do now to diagnose celiac disease. This is not the same as a gluten allergy or a food intolerance to wheat. This is a very specific um, response to wheat gluten. And what it actually does is it completely flattens, it destroys the architecture of the absorptive surface of the gut. So the biggest problem with celiac disease is not that the person just has a gut ache. It's that, that they're losing over time absorptive area to pull food molecules across. So if you have this reaction for a long period of time and you don't do anything about it or you're not aware of it, you can be deficient in all sorts of nutrients and foodstuffs that you require for your existence long term um, because you're literally losing um, surface area and you can lose a lot of surface area before it gets recognized and in an adult that surface area is not easily regained it's probably a little bit easier regained in a child because they're still in growth and development but in an adult once the damage is done then you also have to deal with um, nutrient deficiencies from lack of absorption now you can also have great food reactions to toxins in a food now this is quite common like in eating certain kinds of fish. Um, there's something known as scromboid toxicity. It's really commonly reported with things like mackerel or um, tuna, mahi-mahi, um, um, sardines, anchovies, basically related species of fish that were not preserved properly after being caught. Either they weren't refrigerated quickly and they were allowed to kind of sit for a while and what happens is above um, 
about 16 degrees centigrade, if your fish gets too hot, um, there's a histidine, not histamine, but histidine, this is um, uh, another molecule. And on air contact, it's converted to histamine. And so you can get basically this histamine reaction from eating fish that are improperly processed. You can also get other kinds of um, toxicity and reactions from fish um, that are created with toxins by organisms infecting fish. Um, one that um, is quite common is uh, ciguatera, and it can actually cause some very major um, gastrointestinal and neurological symptoms that could take like up to years to resolve because it's such a potent toxin. So sometimes when you have responses to things and you think you're allergic to it, you're actually having a response to improper processing. Now we can also get food aversion reactions. Um, people can have psychological associations with the food. And this is um, one of the reasons why there are blind food challenges done, especially like in, in children or people who are, seem to be having disproportionate responses to things. Um, in an allergy office, there are blind food tests that you can do to see whether or not you actually produce the allergic reaction when you don't know what it is that you're eating. And, um, and, the, and then often the doctor doesn't know either. It has to be kind of random. But there's lots of people who can psychologically produce symptomatology, again, for the same reason as the EpiPen and the mental field technique are kind of like hand in hand. It's the nervous system and your perceptions actually play a role in how the immune system is um, interpreting something. Now, there's lots of factors in allergy development. Um, we're not going to cover all of them today, but there, there are some interesting um, pieces about um, cleanliness. So here, there's that hygiene theory that means too clean could technically mean more allergic. And so in studies, we've seen that increased allergy can be related to the increased levels of this kind of over hygiene. Um, introduction to an increased use of antibiotics in the population, increased use of these broad spectrum disinfectants and antibacterial soaps. Believe it or not, just plain soap without any added antibiotics in it is um, very antibacterial. You, you really can kill a lot of things with soap. Um, just It's just like you can kill like ocean fish with soap. Um, Early uses of vaccination actually can increase the amount of allergy um, susceptibility, probably because you're not allowing the immune system the challenge of developing um, like it probably is designed to develop. You also see that if people have more childhood infections, they have less allergy. A reduced family size also seems to be associated with more allergies and um, things like quick introductions to cow milk and reduced breastfeeding. Now, I don't know if you know this and you probably, um, you might not all be in the age range of having little kids, but we did do um, a breastfeeding um, microbiome um, discussion, I think probably about a year ago. And most people don't realize this, but a lot of what breast milk actually is, is food for bacteria. In fact, most of the sugars that you find in the breast milk are not for the baby. They're for the bacteria. For, they're for actually building up the complex of bacteria and viruses and fungi that are supposed to be existing inside the gastrointestinal tract. And the human being is actually intentionally feeding those organisms um, in it to its newborn. I, I think it's absolutely fascinating um, bunch of research and um, we're starting to see the implications of this as we tend to destroy flora with <laughs> antibiotics. Also, you will see that there's risks, you know, allergy development is related again to all sorts of um, family factors and the capacity to have proper infections and stay away from antibiotics, just like we're kind of seeing in the last um, slides. Now, when you look at treatment techniques, um, obviously, like I just said, we want to look at microbiome maintenance as a possibility. 
So here's a great example of what the effect of, um, of not having a good microbiome is. Here you can see that um, eczema and eczematous dermatitis and atopic sensitization, that means where you've actually intentionally poked somebody with the antigen, that if you have people who just take probiotics um, versus control, now I'm not for the indiscriminate use of probiotics, just to be clear, but here what we're showing is that if people have a little bit of exposure to normal flora that they're supposed to have in their guts versus people who weren't allowed that opportunity, you can actually reduce a lot of these um, allergy-like events. Now, there's even some evidence that show if you eat a, a little bit of yogurt that you're going to create that same response. So you don't have to get it in a probiotic. In fact, what I prefer most people do is to eat it in a probiotic rich food. So, you know, yeah, you can have a cultured dairy product, but you can also have things like sauerkraut or kimchi, lacto-fermented pickles, um, lacto-fermented condiments. So sometimes you have to make this, or you can buy them sometimes at the health food store or things like kombucha. Now you can't make your whole diet out of those things. You would just feel like a bloated farty person. <laughs> And that's probably not very useful. But a small amount of those actually does help protect us from a, a wide range of allergic responses. Now, just so that you know, when you do use probiotics, you've got to be a bit careful because sometimes you can get probiotics that don't really have very much probiotic in them. I recommend that you get your probiotics from a reputable source. Now, you can also do other things that gut support. Now, one thing we didn't concentrate a lot today is that digestive processes are really crucial to decreasing um, the capacity for allergy. And you can actually go back and watch the digestive health webinar that we did just a few months ago where I'm talking about this in excruciating detail about how to use things to support your gut that are simple and actually improve everything across the board, including gut-associated immunity. So bitters, anything that actually increases the digestive capacity, bitters do that. It used to be a very traditional thing to have bitters before meals. We've kind of lost that. And the only bitter that we habitually eat have nowadays is probably coffee. Betaine hydrochloride that's supporting the stomach acid responses. Lots of people have poor stomach acid responses, especially as we get older. Glutamine, which is the main amino acid fuel for the gut wall. So when we have people who are having food reactions, using things like bitters and glutamine and borage oil. Borage oil is a seed oil that prevents inflammation at the top layers of the gut where it's in contact with food and it improves um, or decreases the leaky, leaky aspect, leaky gut aspect. Now we didn't talk about this as much in this lecture, but again, you can go over to the digestive lecture and see more detail about this. Or if you have other di digestive weaknesses, you can use pancreatic enzymes or other kinds of digestive enzymes if you're vegetarian. And of course, you can avoid things. So the other types of bitter other than coffee, Alara, are things that are typically herbal. So things like gentian bitters, you know, there used to be lots of eau de vies that were herbally based in the bitter herbs, which were very useful for digestion. Um, most spa towns have a, have a bitter. When I trained in rehab medicine in Carlo Vivari in the Czech Republic, um, they had something called Bekarovka. <laughs> it's basically a bitter that you were supposed to take before meals. Now, I also um, wanted to point out that um, I didn't put this really in the right place, but I thought I'd add it in here. You can actually decrease anaphylactic reactions. And I think this is partially to induce immunological tolerance and also to produce mental tolerance. But there was a great study that showed um, that you can decrease um, tolerance or increase tolerance to anaphylactic things by controlled exposures. And I think in the future, this is probably something that's a more um, viable option than completely eradicating all peanuts from all environments. <laughs> which is not very easy to do, not very practical. It's better to protect the person than to try and clean the entire environment. Now, if people have challenges um, with dietary um, allergies or things that they think are dietary allergies, you can also attempt a rotation diet. This is where you actually take different food groups like in rotation. And if you're interested in doing something like this, just let me know because I can really provide you with a handful of rotation diets that have found 
I found to be really useful over the years. You can also desensitize yourself somewhat homeopathically. We will often use this for environmental allergens very successfully and also to a degree to food allergens. It depends on how much of the food allergen that people are, are um, taking in. So I'm hoping that this is giving you a really broad sense of how many different kinds of reactions there actually are and that in order to figure out what it is, sometimes you really do have to sit down and investigate various options and so hopefully um, you have people in your healthcare team that can help you with that. And if you don't have me, and of course I can help you with that. Okay, so <laughs> I'm open to other questions. I also just wanted to show you that we're still on track to do the rest of our lectures up until November. And then I have a number of other ones that are going to be in the beginning of next year. So obviously today's food allergies, the next one is going to be essential oils. Um, that's a fascinating topic about what you can use essential oils for. So hopefully you'll have a chance to come back at late July and we can talk about that. So I hope you have a most wonderful evening. I hope you had a good sense of, of all the different ways that you can respond badly to food. And hopefully it has given you some food for thought about how you might investigate some of your own reactions. Thanks for watching. I love to connect to my patient community to inform and inspire, and I hope you'll join us again in the near future. Don't forget to check out whole-life-medicine.com for more webinars and events.